Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to some of you, and welcome to Raising Bright Children Facebook Live. Very happy that you could join us here today, and those of you who will join us later, I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Thank you for coming, and I'm very excited about our guest speaker today, Kathy Klotz from uh, Intermountain Therapy Animals. I'm going to give uh, her a brief introduction and then turn the rest of the time over to her. Kathy has been the, inter uh, the executive director of this organization since 1997. Prior to that, she uh, worked as a volunteer for the organization with her dog, an Austrian, Australian Shepherd Foster. And um, this is an international organization. It's represented in all 50 states in the United States, as well as 17 countries worldwide. Very impressive in the work that they do. In 1999, they started a program called READ. That's an acronym for Reading Education Assistance Dogs. This is the program that they bring um, different kinds of animals into schools, and they have a specific way that they help children um, who are struggling with reading. Uh, Kathy's going to tell us about all the different things about this organization, but I've asked her to specifically talk about the READ program and that there are probably a number of you who do not have this program in your school districts, and so I've asked her to give you some tips and some suggestions and some ideas of how you can uh, use this program in your own homes with the family pet. So I'm going to turn the time over to Kathy, and if you have any questions, be sure and type them in. We'll get them, and Kathy will answer those questions. Kathy, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you taking time from your extraordinarily busy schedule. Uh, she literally travels all over the world to work on this program in a number of different areas. So thank you, Kathy, and we're going to turn the time over to you. Thank you, Charlene, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I must admit to some trepidation right out of the box here because um, I have been addressing people from, you know, from six to several hundred and everywhere from living rooms to conference centers, but this is the first time I've ever just talked to a green light and not been able to see your faces. So um, I would suggest you'll probably find it more interesting to look at my slides anyway than to look at me. So um, I want to just give you a little background about our organization so you know where we come from and how we have gotten to where we are. Um, next slide. Next. Yeah, so we were founded in 1993 here in Salt Lake City. That's 70 some of our volunteer teams. We now have, it goes between 350 and 400 volunteer teams who consist of a person and their very own pet companion. Um, we go to places everywhere from uh, the airport and college campuses to help people de-stress or and all the way to places like the burn intensive care unit at University of Utah Hospital and one-on-one uh, -on -one therapies with children who have been um, abused in one way or another. So we've accumulated quite a lot of experience and we've learned a lot along the way. Um, we also now have 19 colleague groups around the country who use our training and testing methods. So we've been very lucky and had a lot of success in, in what we do. Um, next slide. Um, the mission of our organization has always been to enhance quality of life through the power of the human-animal bond, which is considerable. Um, and we've found, as I've mentioned, a lot of different ways to do that. Next. And over these 25 years, um, these are about our five favorite words for what we see animals do for people when they're in a therapeutic situation. They offer hope, um, which is essential to life, really. If people lose hope, they don't even care about going on. Um, they comfort in many, many ways, and they're great catalysts and motivators to help people be willing to do what they have to do to move forward. And along the way, they're a lot of fun, which is also a great component in healing and learning is to be able to have fun while you're doing it. Next. So catalysts and motivators, what do we mean by that? Um, our therapists tell us all the time that uh, the people will do things when an animal shows up that they wouldn't do for just the therapist themselves. So they are they get people engaged and willing to participate. The little girl in this picture 
was didn't want to take a walk around the room because she was in great pain and it hurt. But when the dog came, she's willing to take that walk and willing to smile because she's focusing more on the dog than on her own pain. And despite the fact that we think we're all great at multitasking, we are not. Our brains can only do one thing at a time. So literally, patients are less aware of pain when they are with an animal. So that's we rely on that quite often. Next. So this is a picture at a cancer camp um, with our teams up in Montana. Uh, we go to a lot of camps. Um, the little girl on, right had, at the, on the right had just had a new prosthesis put on and was reluctant to walk at all, let alone take a walk around the mountain trail. But when she had the chance to walk with the dog, she was willing to get up and do it and get that important practice. Next. Um, so that's one thing we see a lot in that motivation. It, it, it makes patients eager and willing to participate in their therapies um, early on. Sooner, the sooner we can get involved, the better. Next. Uh, one study on this subject. I'm not going to give you a lot of research, but just some to show you where it comes from. Um, there's a term that therapists use called patient compliance. How willing is somebody to do what they need to do? Um, and in this case, the, the, a, a whole bunch of people were asked right after having a stroke if they would be willing to get up and walk for the first time. And if you can imagine, that's pretty scary because they don't know if they've got the strength. They don't know if their legs will hold them. They don't know if they can balance. So um, when a bunch of people were asked, 28% refused that first invitation to get up and walk. When they were asked if they wanted to get up and walk with the dog, only 7% refused. So a lot more people willing to get up and do it. Once they did it, they walked a lot further because they didn't want the experience to be over. They walked um, almost double what their goal was for that day. Next. There's a little dog in the middle there. He's a little bit hard to see, but his specialty was dancing on his hind legs. And so he made a career of walking with people who were recovering from strokes because they were having such a good time watching him walk along, dance along beside them that um, they walked further than they thought they could and they did more than they thought they were able to accomplish. Next. So in the comfort and joy department, um, we all need that when we're working hard on therapies or working to heal from things. Um, this little person at, up at Primary Children's Hospital was having seizures every five to seven minutes, and they couldn't figure out why. They couldn't get it to stop. Her parents were terrified. She was terrified. And when we put an animal in bed with her, they stopped immediately and did not recur. Um, so what is that? Uh, for many, many years, we've called this magic, really. Um, the dogs know who to be with. They, they know who needs them. They, they cause these kind of things to happen. It turns out there is a scientific explanation behind it. It has to do with the hormone oxytocin, which you may have heard of as parents. It's the what they call the super bonding hormone. It helps you bond with your infant when, you're, when your babies are first born. Um, and the interesting thing about oxytocin is that when you're with an animal, you get twice the, the hit of oxytocin as when you're with another person. So this is a powerful way to make people want to participate and to feel good and to be willing to move on forward. So next, please. So again, just fun. Um, when you're in the hospital, institutional, it's a lot of machinery, cold atmosphere. It's not the best place. People are depressed when they're in recovery. Um, you bring an animal in to see them, whether cuddling in bed or getting them encouraged to move, um, and it's just a lot more fun for them. Next one. Same with this. Um, parents especially tell us that with children, it makes it feel more like home. It's more natural. It's more like real life. And so when we can bring animals in to give them 
a good time where we always do that. So there is tons of research that's accumulated over the past maybe 30, 40 years about animals in therapy, but next slide. We're gonna just uh, let you know that the Harvard Medical School says that if you wanna get healthy, you get a dog, and they've issued a special 55-page report on that subject, so we figure we're in pretty good company when the physicians at Harvard are telling, telling you that that's a good thing. So, um, with some of those things in mind, um, seeing how children always reacted to our animals when, when they were in therapeutic situations, it occurred to us to wonder if we could transfer those benefits over to the reading environment. Next one. Because um, among all this research, it generally says that animals universally provide a beneficial and positive influence on children. So um, thinking on all these things, we came up with our idea for the READ program. Next slide. Yeah. Where kids read to dogs. Um, it sounds like sort of a wacky idea when you first think about it. Um, next slide. Turns we, uh, we did not invent the concept. Um, this is from a, a print ad from the Pear Soap Company back in Victorian England. So people have been doing this by themselves for a long time, but we were the first to set up a real literacy support program utilizing therapy animals who've all been trained and tested and insured to make sure they're safe around your kids and they have the right temperament to, to be engaging. So next slide. Why would you read to a dog? Um, there are a lot of reasons. Next slide. Um, it's these same words that apply exactly the way they do in our medical settings. Um, in education, they provide all these same, same things. So next slide. Um, some of the reasons are to diminish fears. Um, for children who don't feel like they're the, quote, smartest one in the room, they're super intimidated by their peers in school. Um, they're afraid to speak out loud. Um, it, again, it makes them feel motivated. They want to be with the dog. They want to show the story to him. They want things to move forward. So they are interested in participating, and they have a lot of fun while they're doing it. It's also something that turns out to be really important. And I, I do want to emphasize that everything we've learned and everything we try to do in our READ program is to do what happens with parents and children in perfect situations. Um, so that's how a lot of this is hopefully going to be relevant for you. Um, so the next thing that's important about this is that it's very personalized and individualized. Um, our team, our handler and our dog get to know each child that they work with and remember things about them and value them and appeal to the things that are the most interesting to that child. So they get a nice solid relationship and connection that they can count on. Next slide. So these are one of our, our four favorite words in, in education, that fear can destroy intelligence. It's, it's absolutely a fact. Um, when you're afraid, when you're stressed, when you're worried about other things, your brain simply cannot learn at that point. Um, uh, so it affects a lot of other things. If you're a child who doesn't know where you're going to sleep that night, or if you're not sure you're gonna have anything to eat that day, all of those things are major um, inhibitors to being able to learn next. So um, we stick this in there just to, just to remind you um, that reading is a lot harder than you remember at this point. Um, that's a very long word. That means fear of long words. It's just silly, but uh, for people who look at something like that and they've never seen it before, and it's a little bit intimidating. And the whole idea of reading can be very intimidating to children, especially when they're worried about what the children around them think of them. Next. So this is so important. Um, dogs 
are great listeners. That's one of the things that the kids tell us all the time that they value about this. It seems like they listen more when you, mostly when you read to people, they're looking around, not listening to you. So that's something to know as parents, you really need to be paying attention. Don't be on your phone. Um, we had one time, we had a, a TV station interviewing some kids at a library and they were asking this one little girl what she liked about reading to the dog. She said, well, he always listens to me. My mom never does. My mom's always on the phone or always doing something else. And they turned the camera over to her mother and there she was in the library on the phone while her child was undergoing a TV interview even. so. You need to focus on your kids and on what's happening in that interaction. You need to be present in that situation at all times um, to be a good listener. Next one. Um, listening is an act of love, according to Dave Isay, who founded the Story Corps, if you've heard of that. Um, it's one of the best skills to develop any of us at any age. We are not very good at it. Um, as Stephen Covey says, most people don't listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. We wait to get our two cents worth in as soon as there is an opening. So listening is probably the greatest act of love that you could promote with your own children. Next one. Uh, the kids always tell us that the dogs don't ever laugh or judge or criticize which is super important to them when they feel a lack of confidence. Um, this is common. I know he will never go tell my friends that I'm stupid. Um, I stutter a lot and he never laughs at me when that happens. Um, if, I, if I make a mistake, it's okay with the dog. He never laughs, he never criticizes. Next one. So what it means to read with the dog in our program, do you see that triangle there? We like to make sure that the person and the dog and the child all can look in each other's eyes all the time and make direct contact um, so that they can communicate openly together. That's another thing that promotes that um, release of oxytocin into people when they feel listened, heard, uh, listened to and heard they are, um, it feels so good and it's, it's really important. So that's something we promote is making sure everybody can communicate directly. Next one. So everything about read is about relationships and connections. As you are probably aware, um, they first started talking about this in mental and emotional therapies that no progress is possible if somebody doesn't have a relationship that they trust. And that's true about everything that we do. Um, all learning, all growth and development as people, ability to change, to heal, all those things need a strong relationship and connection to support that growth. So again, that's something for parents to think about on a regular basis, um, to, to carve out time to spend with your children in that way. Next. Um, another thing we've focused on in the research, we, we pay a lot of attention to things that go by. One of them is the Annie E. Casey Foundation. You may have heard this. Um, they, they're, they're kind of their motto is, you learn to read so you can read to learn. It's really important for children to have learned well by the end of third grade to read so that they can read to learn for the rest of their lives. And if they don't do this, if they don't, if they're behind, the studies now are showing that they never catch up. They almost never catch up in their life. They never get as much education. They don't finish high school. They don't, um, make as much money, they can't support their families as well, they have more emotional difficulties. So all those things need to get put in place, hopefully by the time children reach fourth grade. And here in the US, we are woefully behind on that. They now estimate that there's about 68 to 70% of our children cannot read well by the time they get to fourth grade. Next one. 
This is another book that would be of interest to you if you want to know about these things. Amanda Ripley went around the world to study other school systems and what things worked the best and how kids made the greatest progress. And it's very interesting. And, and as since you're all concerned already about how your kids are learning, um, this will be a great resource for you. Next one. So we do know that despite whatever inadequacies there might be, that if children have consistent access to books and reading outside their classroom, they do a lot better than those who don't. And that it's what's really important to be able to learn is to have a safe environment where the kids feel emotionally secure and where they have close relationships with other children and caring adults. So a lot of what our read pro program tries to do is to be that nice, secure, safe relationship for children on the lowest end of the socioeconomic scale who may not be getting it um, at home in the ways they need to. Um, there's been a lot of research on the importance of books, access to books. Um, one of the more horrifying studies is that at the highest socioeconomic level, when a child goes to first goes to school, the average child has maybe 14 picture books at home in his own library. And at those lowest levels, there's only been one book in the home for every 300 children. So they're just not getting access to books. And they need to see them and practice with them and have them read to them and be able to have discussions with their parents about all the things. Um, and it, that, it turns out that access to books is more important one study says, then the level of education of the parents in a child's later success in life. Next one. Um, this is one I want to point out to you that you would really love to watch. Um, this is from September 2016 on PBS, the Nova series. It's called The School of the Future. It's a two-hour program, and the one-hour one especially is um, valuable for parents. Um, the, what they were trying to figure out is what we know the most about brain development so that we can make sure children are ready and able to learn um, more so than just giving them facts to learn because as future generations unfold, we don't even know what facts they're going to need to be learning because so much information new information is coming all the time. So this program has a lot of wonderfully valuable things about how to help your child be ready and able to learn. And this about having early access to books is an important one. Um, another one, one of the things they pointed out was that um, in some places now when parents are saying they have time to come volunteer in the classroom, they're saying, don't come to our classroom. Spend that same amount of time at home reading and listening and discussing with your children, and that will be far more valuable to that child. So do check that out. It's, it's available online. Next one. Um, it, it turns out that reading is a very complicated skill. Again, we hardly remember it at this point, but there's two separate areas of your brain that have to be developed and synchronized in order to be able to learn to read. So there's a lot in the NOVA show about that. And um, early reading interventions before they even get to school have great impact on positive brain growth and development. Next one. Next. Next one. Okay, so what we do in the READ program is we practice with all kinds of reading and communication skills. It's not just fluency and comprehension. It's discussing and thinking about and learning new words and getting to share your ideas with somebody else. Um, and it's important for kids to hear language from other people, not just from the screens that they interact with. And another thing we do is send new books home with children 
so that they have something at home that they can read. And, and these are proved to be a great treasure to the kids. What we do is have the dog potograph those books. Um, he puts his paw print in their own books and, and signs his name. And then it turns out that the kids really treasure those a lot because so many of them with the kids we read to just don't have any books. Next one. Um, so, so more about chronic stress, which you will also hear about in that NOVA show. It hampers development. It makes it impossible to learn. Um, it floods the body with cortisol. And when bodies are flooded with cortisol from stress on a regular basis, learning is almost impossible. So children that have to worry about uh, what colors they wear or what path they take to school to make sure they don't get in trouble. That's way different from children in the nice neighborhoods who have secure uh, confidence in knowing what their environment is like and that it's not going to be scary. So all those things interfere with learning. Um, children do need that safe place and positive environment. And having it opens up new brain pathways. So okay, next one. So we, again, I've already, go ahead, go to the next one. Next. So one of the benefits to being with a dog while you're having these reading experiences is the physiological benefits, the flooding of the body with um, the oxytocin. It lowers their blood pressure significantly. It slows their rate of breathing. It just helps everybody calm down and feel really good from inside out. So um, in that way, they can get that from you, but if you've got a pet that would love to sit with you and do these things at home, it would make it even better. Okay, so we do this program in the case where there aren't parents or situations available to, to be able to do it. Um, one of the things they've learned that there's no such thing as average and one size doesn't fit all. Um, as one gentleman says it that I'm going to point to a little later on, children are not empty buckets that we're supposed to fill with facts and information. They are little beings who are blossoming and we need to find out what they care about, what's important to them, and help them develop that. And everything of that is a completely individual situation. And so that's why when we have a read team with those kids, we learn what is their favorite. Is it dinosaurs? Is it math? Is it what are the things they're good at and they care about? And then we help promote that with them. So good learning is always individualized, and that's hard for schools to do when they're trying to deal with really minimal budgets and mass testing requirements and stuff. Okay, next one. Yeah, okay, so sorry. Next one, I've already talked about that. So learning and emotion are well connected. Um, effective learning requires you to be emotionally engaged and when you're engaged, it changes your attitudes about learning, too. If you look at a page that you can't read, why would you even want to? It's not engaging. It's not inviting. So we design ways to make them eager to participate and learn those things. Next one. Uh, the summer slide. You've probably heard about that. Um, for kids who don't read during the summer, it can take them till up to the end of November the next year to catch up to where they were the spring before if they ever do. Many of them don't. And so, again, kids who don't have these opportunities during the summer um, can go further and further behind their peers who are getting things like this. So uh, we do encourage you to keep your kids active on reading things in the summertime. Uh, we participate in a lot of summer programs for that reason. Okay, next one. Kathy, I have a question here. When you talk about the summer, um, could parents bring in the family pet, whether it's a dog or a cat or a goldfish, and actually um, have a similar program in their home like this so that their child can read to you know, the family pet? Yeah. Does, that, does that work? Yeah. Um, if you've got, and in fact, I don't think I have the picture in this presentation, but in many cases, the family cat 
can be better than the, at this than a dog if you don't have a dog who's calm and quiet and has the right temperament to want to sit with you for half an hour or whatever while you're reading. So we a lot of people have found that their cats work really well at home because they love to curl up and lap. So, but you can read to guinea pigs, you can read to your goldfish, you can read to any animal that you might have at home. Participating together is going to make it stronger in the effect that it has on your kids. Does it make any difference if the child has, um, you know, a close connection with that particular uh, pet in the family or? Yes, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things we've, we've noticed, um, uh, people want to know whether this works with kids who have disabilities, for instance, kids who are on the autism spectrum. And absolutely it does. And if they've got a family dog who understands that and is their companion through the rest of life, being able to read together with that animal is makes everything even better. Okay, thank you. Okay, role shift. Um, we've had some kids, we try to make this when we do this in school so that kids feel like they're getting sent to something special to do, not that this is the latest thing people are trying to do to help them because they're such terrible readers. Um, and so one thing that tends to happen when they get in there they feel like they're the tutor. They've never had a chance to be a tutor, and they want to help the dog understand the story. They know the dog is not learning to read, but they're absolutely convinced because he's listening so closely that he wants to know about the story. So they um, are always showing in the pictures. I'm gonna show you some images with that, but they're really cute. So it's really confidence building to feel like you know more than the dog and you can help them learn some things. So next one. Um, last week, a little girl who was reading to Figaro for the first time got to the bottom of the page, stopped, turned the book around so that Figaro could see the pictures. She did that at the end of each page. She didn't show me the picture, just the dog. It turns out this is like a universal thing that happens with these kids. Um, go ahead and show the next three or four slides, Mark. Um, we were started to get pictures from all over the world with children turning the books for the dog to see the pictures. Um, these are amazing. Yeah. And here's reading to that goldfish. This was one of our handlers who her grandson heard her talking about this and she couldn't find him one morning. She turned out he had gotten the bowl, the dogfish bowl down, I mean the dogfish, the, the fish bowl down and was reading one fish, two fish, Dr. Seuss, and pointing out things. Do you see that? It's really great. Um, in fact, this this is something to consider for parents if you tend to be the kind that hover over your kids too much. Um, one little girl who was a very competent reader, but she had parents who were just pressuring her too hard. And so she just pulled down her curtain and she refused to let to read out loud to her parents, no matter how much they demanded it. So when she, when she first started in the read program, she um, would do that. She turned the page one time and said, oh, and then turned the book so that the dog could see it. And the handler leaned over so that they could see it. And she said, she snatched the book back and she said, not you, just him. And she was willing to read out loud to the dog for six whole weeks before she would let her parents hear her read out loud. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, next one. So again, uh, you can go past that one, which is relationships and connections. Um, does the program work with those who have special needs? I just mentioned that, but this was the Utah Special Educator Magazine, and they had one special issue celebrating those things that work, and they chose to put our program on the cover because of how well it works. So next one. So we have a lot of other educational theories that we pay attention to, that we've learned about, and we're always pleased to find out that what we do with a dog and a child is well supported by many other educational theories. This one, Glasser, happens to be that once you've had those basic needs met for food and 
a place to sleep and clothes and stuff. The next four most important things to you are love, power, freedom, and fun. And our program incorporates all those. They feel love from the dog and the handler. They get the power and freedom of learning more things, and they have a fun time while they're doing it. So it's a very um, strong program from an educational point of view. Next one. Um, this one. Uh, I happened to see this bookmark years ago lying on a counter at the library. It said, earn as you learn. And on the back it said, earn money while reading your favorite books. And I said, what's this? So um, I'm happy to tell you this is now defunct. They no longer exist. But I just wanted to talk about the difference between primary and secondary motivators. Because a secondary motivator is if your child reads... 10 chapters in order to earn a certificate from Pizza Hut for a free 42 ounce beverage. So Pizza Hut has a motivation there. They want you to bring your family in and buy two large pizzas and half a dozen uh, large beverages. That can be motivating. It can get people to do it. Um, there are other programs where kids get a dollar a book or a dollar a page or whatever. That's motivating, but that's secondary. You slog through the reading in order to get that other reward. And the thing about reading with an animal is it's a primary motivator. They get those physiological benefits and they feel good from the inside and they want to do it again. Those Primary motivators are a lot stronger than the secondary kind. Next one. Uh, this was a little boy with Asperger's in an after-school program. And uh, his dad started hearing him talk about reading to a dog. And he thought they were doing something wacky. So he inquired. And, and then he started paying attention. And he said, when my son started reading to Buddy, I began to notice how excited he was about reading how he talked about it and about the dog all the time, and how he, the excitement and interest in reading carried over even when the dog wasn't there. So that strong motivation has a lasting effect. Um, we had one mom call us to say that her little boy had um, pulled up a chair and was reading a story to the bookmark that had the picture of his read dog that they had posted on the refrigerator, and he was reading a story to the picture. So um, it, that effect lasts quite nicely. Next one. So uh, the, just some credentials for the program. Um, uh, at the beginning, we wondered whether this would be you know, a flash in the pan or something that was a fad and popular for a while and fade away. And it has never faded away. We've been doing it now for 19 years. Um, this picture happens to be a mural on the wall in a library in Mississippi where they've um, a huge wall size mural about the program. We've had other places where they've actually commissioned sculptures outside the library with children sitting there reading to dogs. Um, next one. Um, we had, uh, at our 10th anniversary, we, our, our governor at the time declared a reading education assistance dog week in Utah. Next one. Um, the U.S. Senate gave us a resolution, number 338, can, with the National Reading Education Assistance Dogs Day on our 10th anniversary. So we celebrate that every day in November. Next one. Um, we had a connection with PBS when they played the Martha Speak series, if any of you saw that. That was to help children develop vocabulary when they were still before they started school. Um, and when they saw our material, they saw one of the kids picking out a Martha Speaks book, and they figured it was destined to be. So we were an outreach partner with them for several years when the Martha Speaks was still being um, promoted. And we appeared with them and with the author of the series around the country um, for several years there. It was a lot of fun. Next one. And the next one. So we're now in 23 countries. This is all of them. Australia all the way to Taiwan and the United Kingdom. We've been to Sweden and Spain and Taiwan to talk about it. Um, it continues to grow. It continues to benefit children. And again, for parents, the best way to incorporate this yourself is to make sure you're listening to your kids and participating with them on a constant basis. 
to build those relationships and give them the chance to practice their skills. Next one. This is one of the cutest ones we got. We, this was from the American School in Khartoum. The teacher wrote to us and said they loved the READ program, so the children chipped in together with their pennies and nickels to buy a donkey that they could read to in the Sudan. And so what's the next one? Um, we, we're, we're like proud of these numbers. We're proud people recognize the value in it, but we do like all of our teams to remember none of it matters if they are not making a difference one by one by one, just like in the starfish story. If they're not having a positive impact on a child every time they get together, that's the only thing that really matters in this program. Next one. Um, and we, we are, we've, we've got a new mission, actually. We have a kind of long mission that's hard to remember about enhancing literacy skills in children, blah, blah, blah. We've just come up with a new one from things we've learned that, for one thing, you have to identify with things in order to incorporate them internally. And what we want to do to succeed in this program, we want kids to identify as saying, yes, I am a reader. So that's our new mission, inspiring kids to say, yes, I'm a reader. So any questions, hopefully? Kathy, I was just going to say, Tiffany Hernandez, who's been making quite a few comments, and thank you, Tiffany. She's an educator in Tampa, Florida, and mentioned that um, they had this in one of the school districts that she taught, taught in, and that it was an amazing, amazing program. So I would just like to recap for uh, during the summer when parents have kids at home, there's a, you can get the family pet, whether it's a goldfish or a dog or a cat, or if you live on a farm, a donkey or a cow. Um, encourage your, your child to uh, read to that particular animal. And as Kathy mentioned, they have handlers. So it's the child, it's the animal, it's the handler. So if you can be uh, play that role as the handler, as the parent, and sit there quietly and listen while your ch child is reading to the family pet, I would imagine that would help a lot. Um, you can go on their website and uh, read about different things and, and um, how you can incorporate this. I think that if it's not in your school, that it would be an amazing thing for you to do with your child. And I would imagine that it would become one of the most important things that you do with your child because it helps them, as Kathy mentioned, educationally for the rest of their lives. Well, and even if you don't have a pet at home, you are pivotal to this experience. If you're, yeah. if you've got that nice, solid relationship with your child, um, they will be cloaked in that positive uh, influence for as long as they go. Um, another place I'd like to suggest, if you haven't heard of it, it's the First Foundation, but it's spelled F E R S T Foundation dot org. F E R S T, and they have a wonderful summary of the statistics and the situations with early literacy and language and brain development and things that you can concentrate on to do before your kids ever even take that first trip to kindergarten. So, Thank you. And another thing, parents, read to your children every single day. Even when they start reading on their own, continue to read to them. And then, of course, have them read to the, the family pet and to you. And as Kathy said, that whole idea of, of that bonding experience that you will have with your child. And, you know, it's something that will stick with them for the rest of their lives. Kathy, thank you so much. This has been extraordinarily informative. We appreciate your time. Your talents, everything that you've given to us today has been uh, fabulous. Thank you. And for those of you who are able to uh, come live, thank you so much. We appreciate your support. And goodbye, and have a rest. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you very much.